hush what comes over the crowd. Um, this is going to be a pretty fun night, so you know, you can laugh at me, don't throw anything at me, whatever. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. My name is Seth Goodspeed, I'm the Director of Alumni and Annual Giving here. Um, just sort of a little background as to how this event happened. Um, last fall, I was working on our annual art sale and saw some of Julie's amazing work come in uh, to, to get sold at the art sale. And as soon as I posted some pictures about it, some of my Carleton friends are saying, oh my gosh, that work is amazing. Um, and I knew then that, all right, this work, this work is special. This project, this 100 Days of Badass Babes is special. And it re resonates with a wider audience than just the MCAT alumni community. So one of the ideas that I had starting back in December was to put together some sort of cross-pollination you know, collaboration with St. Olaf to make sure that if we're to do a presentation about these badass babes that we invite as many people as we can. Um, so I just first want to thank St. Olaf and Emma Peasley who worked with me with the alumni office at St. Olaf for spreading the word, getting, um, getting, every, you know, getting all of you here tonight. Um, I also want to thank Pollen. So after reaching out to Julie, she's just like, of course, whatever you want to do, let's do this. Um, but instantly we're saying that not only is this project, you know, applicable to so many audiences, but there's so many artists that, um, that this project resonates to. So we wanted to make sure to open up this opportunity to talk about badassery in a lot of different ways. And so with that, we invited our amazing panel um, here tonight and with that, um, Monica Nadal with Pollen to help moderate it. So we're really, really grateful for um, Pollen and for St. Olaf and just our entire wonderful MCAD community for bringing all of these wonderful, talented people together. Um, and then lastly, the food outside. If you haven't had anything yet, you really should because the Chow Girls, talking about badass babes, I mean, they really came in at a pinch. We, you know, we wanted to keep this low key. I wanted to keep our expectations, you know, low. So that future, future alumni events, people aren't expecting the moon. And then of course, this comes through and now it's like, great, now we're gonna have to have food every time we do this. So thanks a lot, Julie. Thank you to Chow Girls for their um, really great donation for, for all of our refreshments tonight. Um, I don't really you know, wanna give too much away, but if you know, um, if you're here, chances are you know Julie's work through either the 100 Days of Badass Babes or through her uh, recent publication and uh, illustration work with um, the St. Olaf magazine that was published uh, this past fall or this past spring. Um, but also an adjunct faculty here, all around badass babe. I just wanna turn this over to Julie Van Groel. So thank you again for being here. Hi. Oh, feeling good. Okay. <laughs> Not shaking in the least. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Julie Van Girl. I think based on sort of the faces I can see, um, I know a lot of you from either St. Olaf College or from um, different communities here at MCAD. Um, I was a graduate student here from 2012 to 2014, and then since then I've been both teaching and uh, rocking the uh, print technology department, uh, making all those copies and prints for y'all. So um, I'm glad that I got to know um, most of you in that capacity. Um, so. Yes, like Seth said, um, I'm kind of connected to some of you in one way or another, but I graduated from St. Olaf College with a degree in studio art in 2008. And then I came to MCAD for grad school. Like I said, I graduated in uh, 2014 with a master's in illustration. So, um, but when people ask me what I do, I generally keep it short and I say that I make pictures. And so when people would ask me, maybe about a year ago, if they said, what kind of pictures do you make? I would probably describe something like this, like something kind of silly, kind of bright, you know, usually fluff, visual fluff. And what's kind of ironic about me standing right here and feeling the same feelings as I did in 2014 is that the last time I was at this podium with a group in front of me, I was defending my master's thesis, which was all about making imagery that doesn't necessarily have to like engage in social and political advocacy. Like there's other artwork out there too. And it's kind of funny that I'm now on the other side of that coin expressing quite the opposite, but, um, but yeah, until you know this past year, I would usually use my illustration practice as sort of a place of respite, a place to kind of like 
let myself digest all of the intense things that might be happening in the world or in my life and just kind of like breathe a little breath of relief, which I still believe holds its, you know, its own place in, you know, everyday life. But I'm kind of practicing the other side of the coin now. So, you know, this would be the kind of work I would make, like very family friendly, very, you know, cute and fluffy. But um, overall, the thing that hasn't changed is that the reason that I am so drawn to the illustration world as a practice is the element of storytelling. And the more I kind of delve into that idea, um, both in my academic career and in my personal freelance career, the truer that feels because, you know, the more I, you know, unpack it, the more I realize that the power of storytelling is really the most poignant tool that I can think of in terms of changing any sort of, um, you know, negative situation one might find oneself in, especially if it's something big like, you know, a paradigm, you know, shift that needs to happen, you know, in a grander idea of, in a social political situation. So, um, so I like to think about the elements of visual storytelling in terms of illustration and how that kind of makes me feel like I can make a difference. So, you know, knowing that I like to make lighthearted work, but you know, citizen Julie likes to engage in socio-political advocacy, but doesn't really cross over with my illustration practice. You know, I engaged myself with the MCAD community um, after grad school and I was, very overwhelmed to find that the more I engaged with the students here at MCAD, some of you are in the audience, um, the more I was astounded at how much I had to learn. Because what's amazing about working in a college, um, especially an art and design college, is that you're surrounded by students who are super act active. They're super engaged, especially in socio-political issues. So the students have taught me more than I can express when it comes to issues involving the LGBTQ community, issues that uh, students of color and people of color are facing in the country today, as well as you know other issues of you know social justice and um, you know the kinds of conflicts that we're hyper aware of today. And you know, I found myself learning more and more every day and becoming more and more you know, emotionally invested in these particular ideas. And it became very, very difficult for me to separate my artistic side with this sort of like, you know, awareness that I was you know, becoming uh, more ingrained into. And so on the academic side of things, I was lucky enough to teach the history of illustration. Um, I just wrapped up my third year teaching it, so I've taught it six times now. And for those of you in this room that have taken it, know very well that I, ad nauseum, I talk about how the power of visual media and how much it shapes the way that we understand ourselves and the world around us. And as makers, we have the power to put those kinds of images out into the world and reflect our own values and shape the values of others. And so, you know, repeating this, you know, over, the, over and over again to my students, regardless of what we're seeing throughout history, kind of pointing out the fact that we hold so much power as artists and designers as putting out all that visual media that helps us understand, again, ourselves and our place in the world. And so, you know, kind of realizing that my professor side was saying these things and my advocate side was saying these things, but my illustration side wasn't finding a way to kind of reconcile that. And so last summer, I kind of entered the summer, you know, that break from the academic calendar knowing that I wanted to kind of use this as a pivoting point for my illustration practice. And I was lucky enough to attend ICON, which is illustration conference that's held every other year. This year it was held in Austin, Texas in the middle of July. So 108 degree weather and meeting my professional heroes with a sweat soaked tank top was an ideal, uh, you know, professional situation. But I particularly was super psyched to see two talks. Um, one was by Kayla E., a comic artist and writer who um, is a particularly advocate of uh, people of color and the LGBTQ community. And Sabrina Scott, who was um, defending her, or uh, she was presenting her PhD uh, paper that had to do with, um, that was entitled uh, Illustrating the Other. So both of these uh, talks were promising to talk about representation and about, you know, responsible illustration, and I could not wait to hear what they had to say, and they did not disappoint. I even, you know, made the point of like walking up to them and awkwardly introducing myself. And I'm glad I did because Kayla now um, has become a good friend of mine and we keep in touch um, from afar. And so what, you know, I came to ICON, you know, obviously looking to learn as much as possible, but I particularly wanted to hear what these two had to say in terms of what my role as a white, cisgender, heterosexual, educated woman might have to bring to the table when it came to like certain 
you know, uh, issues of injustice because I didn't want to be a part of the problem, but I wasn't sure about how to become a part of the solution. And what's really great is that um, this is a sketch, not by myself, by Shreyas um, R. Krishnan. My notes from Icon were not this like artistic and cute. They were just like feverish grad school-esque notes. They were not like Instagram worthy at all. But uh, what Kayla said that I, you know, had wrote down here because it was so it, like echoed in my mind and kind of just like lit a fire underneath me as she was talking about. We, a lot of us know that these systems of oppression are in place, whether it's the, you know, the patriarchy, the you know, white supremacy, if it's heteronormativity, if it's you know, the dominance of cisgender culture, but it shouldn't fall upon the shoulders of those communities to solve that problem. They are already the victims of that marginalization. It shouldn't just be up to them to solve that problem. It should be the help of everyone who knows it's, like, that exists, and we should all help to dismantle those systems of oppression, right? And Sabrina Scott was awesome enough to put together a presentation that she had studied past award-winning illustration and kind of pointed out how few people of color were depicted, how few women were depicted, and when they were depicted, they were usually sexualized in nature. And you know, how, you know, as illustrators, we usually are in tune with these kinds of systems of oppression, but we don't often use our medium to challenge them. We usually sort of adopt it as the under, general understanding of the populace, and then we kind of perpetuate it, right? And so she had this amazing, st uh, amazing slide that had uh, cool tips on how to be less of an asshole, which I really appreciated. Which, you know, basically, is interact with, hire, and work with more people of color, with more people who um, who represent, you know, spheres that you don't necessarily belong to. It's essentially listen to the stories of people who are not like you. Work with people who are not like you, right? And what I really, really appreciated, which you know, we all are constantly learning, is that you know, when someone says you fucked up, stay calm, apologize, and learn from it, and then try again. And that's something that, is some, like, that I definitely you know, took to heart, is that like, we should all keep trying. And if we mess up, we should acknowledge it and try to make it better. But we shouldn't make the idea of messing up you know, a reason to not make anything or not try or not try to participate in this. You know, you know, endeavor. So, with all those things in mind, and coming back from a really sweaty, amazing, emotional trip from Austin, um, a seemingly unassuming break from it all was a cabin trip that me and my college roommates take every summer. Um, this this summer it was a kind of a little uh, lake town in uh, in Wisconsin, and I came to these people because these were my favorite humans. These were my close friends from St. Olaf College that I lived with. And I said, um, you know, this is what's on my mind. This is what the things I want to kind of think about. And I think I'm just at this point where I really want to take my illustration in a different direction. And of course, they have all different kinds of backgrounds and all different, you know, skill sets. And they all gave me amazing, you know, encouragement and advice and kind of taking all of their, you know, their ideas and their encouragement allowed me to kind of formulate this little idea I had. I wanted to take you know, an Instagram project, which seemed unassuming, and I was going to do a daily post, and 100 days didn't feel like that long, so that was fine. And I was, and we were, you know, we had been talking about amazing, you know, female figures that we all admired, so I was like, well, this is a no-brainer. I'm just gonna do a badass woman every day for 100 days, and I'm gonna Instagram it, and it's gonna be amazing. And it was essentially just a personal project. I just wanted to work on my drawing skills, which is never a bad idea, and I also wanted to learn something new every day. And um, I had no idea what was in store. But this is one of the biggest skill sets that I got from that weekend was how to do a power pose, which I could really use right now because there's adrenaline rushing through my body. So if you're ever feeling nervous, just do a little superwoman pose or hands up in the air, which you might have to do after this just so I can you know, shake this off. So some of these women are in the audience, and I appreciate you uh, dealing you know, with me putting your picture up on the screen. Um, <laughs> deal with it. So. Um, so yeah, essentially, um, together with that former group of women, we had a Google Doc, and I said, I need 100 amazing women or LGBTQ, non-binary, or femme-identifying femme people that I could profile. And within an hour, my 100 became 250. And so I thought, okay, I got plenty to work with. And of course, every day that list grew because this is an extremely, you know, uh, plentiful subject to take on, luckily. It's a good problem to have. So day one, I decided it was August 1st. It felt like a really clean, good day, first of the month. Uh, you know, it felt like a good time to start. That way, for the first 31 days, I knew what day it was, too. So um, I was like, oh, it's day three, because it's August 3rd. So I started with 
none other than Michelle Obama, because she had just uh, finished get delivering that amazing DNC speech. And so I was like, she's on my mind, she's on other people's minds. I drew a more elaborate illustration of her, because I wanted to do her justice, of course. And I was like, well, what do, what do I not know about Michelle Obama? And I just kind of like dug around on the internet, and I found a really funny anecdote about how right before Barack Obama gave an amazing DNC speech, um, even before he had run for president in, oh, um, in 08, I think it was like the, pr the prior presidential election, and it just kind of made the world know who he was. Uh, she apparently gave him a little hug and said, don't screw it up, buddy. And so I was like, oh, that's an amazing story. I'm going to write that. And so, because most people know who Michelle Obama is. And so, moving forward, the little write-ups that I had alongside these portraits became a little bit more elaborate because I wanted to know, I wanted the audience to know who this person was and why I chose them. Like, Sister Rosetta Tharp, if you're lucky enough to know who that is, is great, but if you don't know, here's who that is. And here's a YouTube link you should look up, and here's the song you should definitely listen to, right? And so, it became this sort of portrait and writing project, which meant more and more time out of every single day for 100 days. And so, but I couldn't help it. And I, this is when I plug the St. Olaf Liberal Arts Education, because research and writing and making the, the linguistic connection to the, these histories was just as important as drawing these, pe these people's portraits. So, you know, as I posted this on, inst in, on Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter, I found that you know my my audience was widening, which was really exciting. I was engaging with people that I didn't know, um, and I had way more connections at by the end of it than I ever ever had anticipated. Um, and so, a hundred days, uh, every story broadened my understanding of history, of what people are capable of, because each one of these women overcame some sort of obstacle. Some of them are unimaginable to me, and some of them are ones that I can completely identify with, and everywhere in between, right? And so it became abundantly clear that, you know, this was too broad of a subject to wrap up in just 100 days, but it was starting conversations, and it was making connections with people, and um, there was, you know, there was lots of different, you know, people reaching out and publications that were um, asking me about my project, but it was the individuals that usually got me the most excited. Um, probably a really great example is w checking my phone in the middle of the night and having Ilhan Omar requesting a Facebook message from me, um, and hashtag pee pants is the trending topic in my brain all the time. <laughs> Anytime there's good news or exciting news or something scary, it's always hashtag pee pants. So, um, but from that connection, just because she happened to see my portrait of her, um, I was able to keep, um, keep in touch with her and started working with her and providing um, different visuals to assist her in her campaign and eventually like the celebration of her being elected to the Minnesota legislature. Yay! So, um, and I've been lucky enough to keep in touch with her since. And so this is something that I was able to make a connection with someone who I revered greatly and was kind enough to reach out to me and I was able to make a connection with someone who I, you know, am very different from, but I'm so, so grateful that I know her story and her, you know, her connection to in a very vital part of the community that I live in. Um, and so not every single one, you know, ended up with a collaboration. Sometimes it was just a, like a very simple acknowledgement from the person that I um, drew a portrait of, Roxanne Gay, one of my favorite writers. She just simply said, oh, that's really nice on Instagram, and of course, hashtag pee pants, because it's Roxanne Gay, right? So, and what she didn't really know is that, of course, I, you know, I admire her, and I admire everything she writes about, but there's one particular idea that I encountered in, uh, I think, the introductory essay in Bad Feminist, is that she has this, I she expresses this idea that, you know, we are all imperfect, and that's one thing that, if I've learned anything from this project, is that every single human being that I encountered in this project is an imperfect human being. And that doesn't mean that they deserve any less reverence that, than they're getting and that, they, you know, that we give them. And Roxane Gay has this, uh, she writes that, you know, she embraces this label of a bad feminist because when we put people up on this feminist pedestal, they're expected, they're expected to pose and be perfect. And as soon as they F up, we knock them down and they are no longer deserving of our, you know, of our consideration, which is a huge problem. If someone messes up, especially if they acknowledge it, we need to be open to letting them learn from it and try again, right? Kind of like what Sabrina Scott said on that awesome slide. So um, Roxanne Gay's like 
open embrace of her, you know, problematic, you know, sometimes, you know, I like to listen to rap that is extremely demeaning to women and I'll dance my ass off. And, but that doesn't make her, you know, any less of a feminist. She's just an imperfect human being, right? So Roxanne was a, you know, a voice that I hear in my head very regularly. And I, you know, I am lucky enough that I got to know her a little bit better through this project. So, you know, I'd love to say that 100 days flew by, but the reality was that this was about two hours out of my day every day, and I didn't want to miss a day. There was a few that I had to, um, but, you know, I learned more than I can probably express. And the tricky thing about my, you know, arbitrary assignment of August 1st being the beginning of the project was that, you know, about a weekend, I was like, when is this going to be done? And I looked up, when is 100 days from August 1st? And it was November 9th, the day after the presidential election. And when I found out that back in August, I was like, well, it's pretty clear what day 100 is going to be. And as we all probably very rawly remember that there was a big surprise for us on November 9th, right? So, you know, approaching November 9th, I was just as excited as, you know, most people probably were in this room. Um, and I had something really celebratory queued up, and of course, November 8th happened. And there was an actual photo that someone took of me on that day. <laughs> I was pissed. I was so disappointed in more ways than one, and it wasn't just because Hillary was this perfect pedestal, you know, feminist, you know, leader that we were going to have, but I was so disappointed that such a clear choice was not so clear to so many people. And so I went home, I erased my amazing confetti animated GIF, and I drew a more solemn but still celebratory 100th portrait. And you know, that day, November 9th, I came to MCAD campus, which just kind of felt like the safe place to be that day because um, I actually ran into Seth that day. And I said, this is probably the best place that I could possibly be today. And Seth said, it's good to know that when the Death Eaters are descending upon us, that we have our Hogwarts. <laughs> and you could feel the sadness in the air here, like the students probably remember. It was a very, very sad day at MCAD. But I was so lucky that I had these 100 stories in my brain of all these women overcoming impossible things. And I was like, you know what? We can get through this. I don't know how, but I know we can. And so I did what I personally could do. Um, I had 100 portraits of people that people uh, were responding well to. So I put prints up for sale, and I was able to raise uh, $3,500 for the ACLU in about a month, which was amazing, and thanks to a lot of matching, and it was, you know, it was a collaborative effort for sure. Um, and of course, I kept on thinking, what most people were thinking is, what do we do? What can I do? How can I, you know, what actions can I take right now? And I kept on thinking of another quote that I learned from one of my badass babes. This is Wilma Mankiller, the first female um, Native American tribal leader. She was the first Native American chief. And uh, she has since uh, passed away. Uh, I believe she passed away shortly before the project began. But she had a saying that I'm going to paraphrase. But she said that when you encounter trouble, be a buffalo. Because when a storm comes, cows run away from the storm. But buffalo run into the storm because they get through it faster. It's messier, but you get through it faster. And so I was like, well, I'm thank I'm so glad I know that right now because I've got to put my head down and we, we got to just get through this. And so I was the buffalo and I was like, how can I be the buffalo? I need to keep like my head down and moving forward. I'm not going to retreat. And so I had this project. I had the attention of a fair amount of people and uh, there was the plannings of the beginnings, uh, the beginnings of the plannings for the Women's March. And so um, I was contacted by um, a man named Chuck Olson, who works for a VR company, and they were planning this really wild idea of a 40-foot activist woman named Rosa, kind of a cross between Rosie the Riveter and Rosa Parks, and she was going to be this virtual activist going to march upon Washington. And if you downloaded an app, you could see Rosa like marching down with everyone else, right? And so they needed visual material to kind of promote it, and they wanted me to do a badass babe portrait of Rosa. 
And so when I heard about their des description of Rosa, the first thing I thought of from you know, the canon of my history of illustration class was my favorite picture of Rosie the Riveter done by Roman Rockwell, not as quite as well known as the one by um, H. Howard Miller, which is the We Can Do It Rosa, right? Um, I love this Rosa, and all my students know why. We talk about it a lot. But I love her because she was the pinnacle of what was seen as the patriotic, badass woman of World War II. These were the women who entered the workforce while the men were away at war. And so Rosie is not only handling a rivet gun and looks like she can actually handle it, but she's enjoying a sandwich unapologetically. And she's also sporting all of her gear, which shows that she's donated to all of the different war bond efforts that were going on at the time. And so I was like, I know exactly the homage I want to make with Rosa. And so I updated Rosa for 2017. <laughs> she traded in her rivet gun for a bunch of progressive um, resistance literature, as well as a Congress phone list, which I know some of us have saved in our phones. And instead of her war bond efforts, she's donated to Black Lives Matter, the Trevor Project, LGBTQ um, efforts, um, the No Deep, DAPL, Planned Parenthood. Um, so, and also, this is a little bit hard to see in the Rockwell version, but Rosie is resting her foot on Mein Kampf, and so I updated that too. <laughs> and so, from there, that was one project, and you know the, the march was still approaching, and I was like, I still have all of these amazing women that like are kind of what where we came from, and I decided that I wanted to contribute more to this like march that was sh like showing itself to be a very important you know thing that was going to going to go down. So um, I kind of repurposed a lot of the babes and added a few new ones and made free posters for download for the march for people to print out and carry um, at their various marches around the country. And I was super, super jazzed about how much, or how far and wide they, they ended up going. Um, I had, um, I, w I attended the St. Paul march and I encountered people I didn't know who were carrying them. Um, they were sported from Los Angeles to Washington DC to Seattle. Um, and even small town ones in um, like uh, Longville, Minnesota. Uh, and it was super exciting because it showed that like, I literally wanted to bring the stories of these women with us forward into this like movement of you know, hope and resistance. And I wanted to show all the folks that we were marching for and who we were marching with. And I wanted to make sure that like, I paid homage to all the people who paved the way of the, like, for the ability to actually participate in something like the Women's March. Um, and so you know, I was super jazzed to see all of like, the sort of camaraderie that was coming out of it. And even um, perusing the New York Times website, I uh, looked at a photo of the trocador Trocadero. And again, we have a hashtag, Le Pee Pants. <laughs> And so kind of, you know, the march came. We had discussions about it. We, you know, we learned a lot from it. And, you know, I continued to get a lot of, you know, um, questions and attention about that project. Um, but, you know, I kept on thinking about like, all right, I'm st I still want to move forward. Like, I, this isn't like this problem or all of these problems aren't going away. And so, you know, I began getting in touch with things more locally. Um, like Seth mentioned, I was lucky enough to get in touch with St. Olaf Magazine and they asked me about the project, which allowed me to connect more with Oli's, especially um, alumni that you know, I had never met or had, you know, had seen my work but never realized I was an Oli. That was really exciting. Um, but yeah, moving forward, it, it, it feels like I'm looking more on the home front. I'm looking at folks that are nearby that I still want to connect with, um, that I might be able to find a way that my, my mode of storytelling might be able to help elevate their stories or the stories of their communities. And um, that might be, you know, revered figures like Nakima Livy Pounds or Jana Shortall. Um, or these amazing students that I have the pleasure of working with every day or had the pleasure of being insanely proud of this last week when St. Olaf, um, the St. Olaf students held protests against a horrific threatening racial um, incident that happened on campus that was a reflection of a much bigger problem. And the students were so genius in recognizing that their tactics of addressing the problem had to be institution-wide. And I'm so, so proud of them. And I'm 
trying to work with students on those campuses or on the on the sustainable of campus to see what I can do to donate my time, my efforts, my support in the same ways that I love seeing and working with the People's Library here at, at MCAD. They're a student organization that focuses on LGBTQ and r racial justice. And I've done a few things with them, but um, I would love to kind of commit myself more to both of those, you know, kind of student-run resistance organizations, right? Um, and that's kind of a like a something I want to in, uh, invest in long term because it's it's important, and I don't want anything to fizzle away, particularly with the recent events at Saint Olaf. But my plans for the summer are pretty pretty set in stone um, because this past week I found out that next February on International Women's Day there will be a Badass Babes book <laughs> released. <laughs> so. So I hope to use that opportunity as, you know, a way to elevate the stories of all these people, to use, you know, whatever I have to offer to be able to share as many diverse types of stories as possible. Um, but, you know, moving forward after the book, after, you know, the next election, I still want to figure out how we can continue to responsibly tell stories and more importantly, take time to hear one another's stories because that's the way that we're gonna change things, is that we're gonna change the way that we understand ourselves and we understand one another and kind of shift that narrative that we all have in our minds to be able to align ourselves with more you know, you know, of a just um, community, whether that's here in Minneapolis or down in Northfield or in the United States or the world. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs> I talked for a while, so how are we doing on time, Seth? It's 7 11. Give me a slushy. We're doing fine? Okay. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> Thoughts? Yay book! <laughs> Yay book, yes, I agree. That was a definitely hashtag pee pants moment of this past week. <laughs> Thanks for the giggle. <laughs> Uh, Quarry Books. They're based out of Boston. Yeah. Are you writing the verbiage or just doing illustrations? That's an excellent question. We're still working that out because that's a big difference between writing and illustrating and illustrating. So um, we're working that out. With the timeline they gave me, I know what I hope for. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's one thing that um, I didn't mention during the talk is that uh, if I were to do it again, um, I would definitely try to reach out for more of a collaborative effort because the writing and the research and the drawing and the posting and the reacting and responding was um, way more work than I realized it would be. Um, but I'm not really good at asking for help or keeping my expectations low. So I probably would do the same thing again. <laughs> We'll see. So keep an eye out. International Women's Day on February 2018. Woo woo. Yeah. Yeah, Megan. That's a good question. So yeah, I was very, um, I had low expectations about how public it would be. Um, and the short answer is hashtags. And as a 31-year-old woman, I don't like using hashtags. It's one of those things, like, if I were to use the word lit, like, that doesn't sound good coming out of my mouth. So, like, I don't use it because I don't fully understand it. Um, we've tried figuring it out. It doesn't, we don't know. Um, so the whole social media thing, like, I'm, I'm, you know, Facebook was, like, halfway through college, and Instagram was, like, two years ago for me. So... Using hashtags is just kind of like, oh, this is like a language I don't speak. But I'm slowly like unlearning that association because it's a really great way to connect with people. And it's allowed me to connect with other artists and other activists and other just awesome people just because Instagram is super smart and finds people that hashtag the same things I do. Um, so I think the short ant, like the, the kind of the beginning of the snowball was I hashtag feminism something. And, um, you know, one 
you know, journalist found it and gave me a shot and then published a thing. And then somebody else saw that published thing. And then it kind of snowballed from there. But yeah, it, it took a lot of like self-promotion and like, you know, standing on a thing with like a megaphone with like, I'm doing a project, which was really uncomfortable. But um, yeah, it was, it was cool to kind of see that, see how effective that could be. A little bit. It's still an uphill battle, which you know. I think I have, I'm really lucky to have people in my life that are like, do it. Do it. You're good. You're do it. Do it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then I hit send and then it happens. So um, there's a really great, it's now like a meme and like an enamel button, like everything else. But like, it's a Venn diagram and there's, um, you know, unapologetic narcissism and crippling self doubt. And where they overlap is art. <laughs> So the crippling self-doubt thing is sometimes a little bit hard for me to overcome, but yeah. Should we open up the discussion to a bunch of other badass artists and designers? Yeah, cool. I'm gonna do a power pose for like 30 seconds while they sit down. Should we all stand up and do a quick power pose? Okay, it's like scientifically proven that if you stand like this or like this, your body stops pumping like adrenaline and starts pumping testosterone. <laughs> Science proves that this makes you feel powerful. I do this before every class. And also it airs out your pits. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. I'm super psyched. Um, I'm going to hand the podium slash microphone space over to um, our lovely host, Monica Nadal from Pollen. Oh, or you can have a seat. So how about, yeah, I'll introduce our, our awesome moderator. Um, her name is Monica Nadal. She uh, works at Pollen Midwest, and she's also currently working at MCAD to uh, get her graphic design certification post-baccalaureate, uh, which is how I first met her. Um, and she is going to be kind of leading our conversation, but she's a badass in and of herself. So let, would you help me welcome Monica Nadal, please? Come on down. If you want to have a seat, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Here, I'll Hi. do less than here. <laughs> first up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> This is Leslie Barlow. I don't have their information. Hey, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> Leslie, do you want to give a quick spiel about where you come from, what you do? Yeah. Um, so I know some of you uh, already, but uh, I graduated from MCAD's MFA program last spring, so in 2016. But I went to undergrad at University of Wisconsin Stout and graduated from there in 2011. So I had a few years in between undergrad and grad school. Um, currently, I work out of a studio in uh, the Northrop King Building in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, I also work at Juxtaposition Arts. I teach youth uh, up there in North Minneapolis. And I'll start teaching uh, drawing at the U of M in the fall. So yeah. Oh, and I also work for Northern Lights uh, that produces Northern Spark. Um, every summer, a really awesome arts festival all night long. So I have a couple of different things that I do, <laughs> but I'm coming off of a, um, a pretty big exhibition that was at Public Functionary um, called Loving. Um, and that exhibition was funded by the Minnesota State Arts Board. I won a grant, an artist initiative grant for that project. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a 10 piece uh, exhibition um, featuring interracial families to co to commemorate the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case that uh, 50th anniversary is this year. Nice. Awesome. Up next, Allegra Lovestet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allegra Lockstead. I'm an illustrator and graphic designer. Um, I also mentor in the MFA program. Um, my mentee right now is Alina Stapleton. She's awesome. Um, and I often partner with local organizations that do great causes. Um, and I typically work as an illustrator doing editorial pieces that also 
kind of focus a lot on my interests. Um, and just to kind of speak to the work that's up there, uh, I did branding for I Minneapolis, which is a great event that Sarah Edwards does, where she celebrates a lot of like local community um, movers and shakers. And then um, I've been very fortunate and excited to continue to do work for Pollen, Ooh. Monica, um, and Julie, and Julie, who's here, <laughs> and Megan and Jamie, and their whole staff is amazing, and they do a lot of amazing conversations and storytelling. And then this bottom image is for uh, Lenny Letter. It was a uh, post-election feelings image, and how I just felt tangled up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Molly Sanford. Hi, everyone. I'm Molly Sanford. I have an experience. I, my, my background is in building, so I've spent a long, lot of time working in male-dominated fields. I was an exhibit fabricator at the Science Museum for many years, and now I work in the College of Design at the U of M, and I help students build things, which is really fun. This other thing that I'm building is totally different. It's not a physical thing like I'm used to building. It's um, a social skill sharing community called Able Babes. Um, and it's very new. It's kind of weird to be talking about it on a panel, but <laughs> it's exciting. I'm learning a lot, of, a lot about building an organization and it's been really fun networking with people. But anyway, Able Babes is basically a scouts program, you know, like for kids, but for adults, because I realized that all my friends and all of their friends have so many amazing skills that we just don't share with each other. So it's finding a way to be whimsical in kind of the scout sense, but also more formal and figure out some structure on how to share your skills with your friends and make new friends, because friendship is the best. <laughs> True. <laughs> We have Lucy Shefty up next. I think it is now. Hi, my name is Lucy Shefty. Um, I am a graphic designer. I work with Miller Dunwoody right now, architecture, um, working in their marketing department. Um, a lot of my work has been primarily in the in American Indian community um, and uh, like far. So <clears throat> just to speak to some of these pieces, um, this AIM piece that I created um, went to the UN and they passed that around. It was a postcard to, to just let them know that they're planning events and whatnot, but they wanted to create something to speak to that. Um, and then I did some design work for No Doppel. And that was just in collaboration with um, a friend of mine who was out there on the front lines and just needed something quick and like immediately. So, you know, I was under the gun with that. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors, I created that logo on the fly for them. They didn't have a logo. So I was like, hey, you need a logo. <laughs> and then I sold it to them. <laughs> so, um, yes, I graduated um, from MCAD in 2016 from the advertising program. Um, like I said, my background is in design. I started studying design in 2012 at MCTC, where I double majored in graphic design for print and web. So I'm pretty diverse in my uh, skill sets. Nice. Cool. All right, and I'll join everybody. And this might be hard to see, but if y'all want to like tag or follow all these amazing people, we'll try, try to make it visible. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Great. So everybody, um, I kind of want to just start again and give a quick introduction to me because I was like in the moment of like sitting down and I forgot to do a quick intro. But again, my name is Moni Ganadal and I am with Pollen Midwest. Um, for those of you who have heard Pollen or know a little bit about Pollen, we are um, a nonprofit here in Minnesota and we do a lot of community engagement. Um, it's not your typical nonprofit. We do a little bit of everything when it comes to storytelling, um, events, and also job opportunities. And I do a lot of their communications and engagement. Um, and I'm just really thrilled to be in this room right now with all of you to talk a little bit more about each and every one's work throughout the years and um, just impressed by Julie's work so far. So thank you so much for having us tonight in this space. Um, 
So just kind of going over the presentation and everything, I wanted to open up the space to ask a question first to Julie regarding your work. Um, and then I wanted to open it up for all our amazing panel here um, for another question that I have for you. But um, you walked us through, like, I would say a roller coaster of emotions. And it was great. It was, it was amazing. I hope everybody enjoyed it um, as much as I did. But I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about your, like, where you are right now looking back and what you wish you could have done differently. And especially now that you just released the fact that you're having a book, like, next year. That's amazing. Like, what things do you have in mind that you want to change on that? <laughs> Good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, thinking about lessons learned was kind of tr tricky just because, um, like I said, uh, it was a lot of work. Um, it was, yeah, it was a lot more work than I probably anticipated, but the thing is, is that, like, I set my own rules, so I'm a masochist, apparently, so um, I think when embarking on something like that, I, I, if I did it again, which I may well do, um, I would establish really strict boundaries for myself, just because with such a, an important topic, I wanted to do justice to every single story, and that meant that every likeness needed to be as best as I could, and every story needed to be as, you know, encompassing and relevant and, you know, poignant as possible. And that meant that I had really high expectations of myself, and I didn't always meet them. But um, I think that I would, if, if I did it again, knowing what I learned, I would probably either ask for help, which, I, like I said, is not something I do very well. A lot of you know that. Um, and, or and or just kind of make very strict boundaries about like this is what the drawing will look like and this is my time limit and this is how long the, the writing will be. Um, but I don't know, I still think that like it was super hard work but usually when things are that hard you learn the most so uh, it was, I'm glad it went down the way it did. I'm glad the it looks like this, you know, it's in its own you know, imperf imperfect glory but like uh, yeah, I think that the best things that address these kinds of issues are probably collaborative anyway, because I am just one point of view, and I'm one person, and I think that the best way to kind of represent this wide variety of stories would probably be from a collaborative effort. So I think in the future, that's why I kind of want to like connect with others to do stuff like this, just because that way it's not just my voice and my, you know, m my point of view with all of its blind spots and stuff. So, yeah. And are you planning on including these 100s to the book, or just are you going to start from scratch or include a few of them? Or not starting from scratch? No. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a mixture of some of the ones I have already and a few that I didn't get around to, or you know, since it's going to be. I'm lucky that it's going to be a book that's going to be translated in other languages. So, you know, perhaps our local hero, Jenna Shortall, you know, might not be as well known, you know, outside of the Twin Cities. Um, she should be. But uh, uh, thinking about like more universal um, names that I might not have gotten to. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit of both. But I have a chance to kind of go back and like, oh, I didn't get to do Florence Nightingale. I get to do Florence Nightingale now. You My know. mom was really sad about that. She's the one who emailed me <laughs> and she made sure. Me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, just getting a, ch a chance to be like, oh, because of course that list could have been millions of names long. Um, so I get this chance to like. And are you, you giving know, yourself a time frame again? Like five the publisher, days to the, the publisher is giving me the time frame. Right. <laughs> no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure at all. But yeah. Are you asking for help in any ways? For I, the am book? I am. I am asking for help for sure. And whether I get it or I get more money yeah. for not getting help is the conversation right now. I mean, to be blat blatant about it, but um, I would prefer the help just because I know my limitations thanks to this project. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, I'm learning to ask for help. That's another thing I learned from this project. So, yeah. Wonderful. So um, now turning it over to our panel. I kind of wanted to learn a little bit more about um, your work, your previous work or work that you're doing right now, and how um, do you view your work 
as bringing down barriers between communities, like um, projects that you've worked on in the past where you've seen that come together and what was the process or like future projects, for example, with Molly, your work of like, you know, you're working on this, there's not like a clear set structure like of where you want it to go, but it's also like you're bringing people together and how that makes you feel with your work and how you translate that. Right, I think because it's such a community-focused project, I can't really sit in my basement and work out all the details. Like, I did that up to a point, and then I started asking people, you know, how would, what kind of an event would you lead, or what, what sorts of structure do you think people will need? And then you get to a point where you just have to start doing the thing. So we just have to start doing Able Babes and having these meetups where people share what they know. We find ways to like I was talking about whimsy, I think is really important because as adults, you kind of lose that sense of fun and that sense that like, I can try anything. I feel like that kind of dies for you when you reach a certain age, you finish college, you are a server in a restaurant for two years and then you get a real job. Not that serving's not a real job, but that's how I felt after college. And then, you know, you focus less on things that are just for fun or things that you might really suck at. So if, so what, how do you make that sort of structure so you, it's really welcoming for you to try a thing and suck at it because otherwise you stop trying things. And I think if you stop trying things, you stop meeting people that are not like you. And I think that's just a really simple way to keep, to stay open, to stay open to learning new skills, but also meeting new people. Um, so I'm really excited to just start trying it, doing it, doing the thing. Anybody else want to add to current projects or anything like that that you're working on where you've seen? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, well, a current project that I'm working on right now is a collaboration with um, some friends of mine that are organizing a water summit um, here in Minneapolis, I think. Well, all of the planning is, co is happening here, um, and it's in collaboration with First Universalist church too so like they are you know providing the meeting spaces and you know and i'm assisting them in their digital design you know um assisting them in that capacity um but it's um th it's projects like those where you know like you want to be able to provide assistance and whether or not you know you're working pro bono you know for free um sometimes that happens where it's like the project is meaningful and you're like okay i'm gonna do this um, but yeah, I guess that happens for me. I don't know. That is so cool. See, I'm actually doing a show at First Universalist Church too next year, which they reached out to me and I didn't really know like what they were about. But after meeting with them, like, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. They're, they're really cool over there. Um, they're very inclusive. Yeah, they are. It's, yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, I think for me, I, a lot of my work comes from a very, um, uh, I use the personal to talk about a lot of like universal things and so a lot of times I'm like uh, using family members or friends like people very close to me to talk about you know larger social issues issues of identity and race and things like that which can not really f even though I'm talking about these larger issues that are totally relevant you know to the community it's it does it before my loving project it did feel a little um, focusing inward and so what I wanted to do, um, you know, speaking to the idea of like, uh, how does my work reach out more to the community is um, with the Loving Project, which, um, which I kind of explained uh, earlier, is I wanted to make sure I was reaching out to families um, that I was not related to. Um, and not just families that I knew personally, but that I was recommended to get in contact with people that might be interested in the project or speaking about um, their relationships, um, you know, how they met and how uh, possibly they have overcome adversity or uh, difficulties um, with, you know, their different family dynamics um, being an interracial family. And that was really, um, Oh my gosh, it was quite an experience, you know, meeting, uh, painting people, <laughs> like people that you're meeting in real life is, is uh, very um, humbling. It's very emotional, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, complicated and uh, 
uh, tense, real topics, uh, like how race is impacting how you interact with your children. Um, and so uh, it was very intense, um, but it was a, an eye-opening experience because um, not only being able to have these conversations with families that I did not know from the Twin Cities community, but then also taking that conversation um, and then having an impact, the painting over a period of months um, was yeah, it was definitely something really unique. And then at the exhibition, having <laughs> the paintings up and the families there, and then the families, you know, friends and family, you know, coming out to see the work, it the exhibition ended up being this like something I had I did def I definitely did not anticipate, mm -hmm. um, and that was basically because I reached out into the community to have them be a part of the work, um, which then you know kind of expanded tenfold, you know, with them, you know, bringing in their own communities. And and that opens up, like, brings us to the point of the viewers. The viewers who are looking at your work, um, they're getting a perspective on what you're putting out there. And I think as an artist, you know, I would like to hear a little bit more about your experience of capturing the essence when you're working with your projects, whether, um, you know, do you ask yourself or do you get frustrated with the fact that you're like focusing too much on that essence because you also think of how the viewer is going to perceive that? Like talking a little bit more about that, Allegra. My microphone. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of also talk a little of what you just said, Leslie, which I really loved hearing more about your show and a huge point of interacting with other people, especially people, you know, whether you're part of that community or communities that you're not part of, I guess, and to kind of talk about um, maybe, I don't know if this is touching on what you're asking, Monica, but about like, um, I guess, representing those people. And like, I think um, as visual makers and visual people or creatives, or uh, I, I don't know what words they use, maybe creatives just as overall, um, we play like a huge role of translating reality. And I mean, I'm still really new to this. And I'm still learning all the time. And I'm just thinking about like, um, so the image that was up here with pollen, for example, like it's supposed to, sh like it shows many women who are diverse. And there's one woman who's a person of color, but she has straight hair. And I made that years and years ago. And like since then, I've had the pleasure of interacting with um, Bianca Dawkins, who's like an African American woman. She's awesome. Um, she leads like a few great endeavors in town. And one of these endeavors is a group that kind of seeks to transform the salon industry in town. It's called One Through Four C. And basically, that's sort of this expectation of like women, especially black women or women with curly hair, um, that they have like this like pressure to conform and to assimilate. And I look at that image now um, where I depicted a woman of color with straightened hair. And I think about like, like I was looking at this for this project. I really love that work. But then at the same time, I'm like, oh my god, I'm part of the problem. I, I'm part of this world that basically is asking, you know, whether it's like their hair, but like black women to conform in this certain way. Um, and I guess like what I'm saying, like looking at that image and now since knowing Bianca and talking with uh, Dre, who's like a fantastic hairstylist in town, or Mahogany, who's an amazing hairstylist. Yeah, right? Mahogany. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just like these very strong, beautiful, confident women. And I'm so grateful to like have the opportunity to, you know, make a mistake in my book of like, well, I wouldn't say mistake, but it's just like I don't, I don't know that perspective, and I'm so honored that I get to hear it. And I wonder, with like loving, it was maybe a similar experience of like being able to like interact and then have that change how you make images. And now for me, like looking at that image, and since knowing Bianca or knowing like a ton of other women who've gone through those traumatic salon experiences, um, I now like. Like if I do depict like a woman of color, it's like, okay, like hair, we got to think about that. It's, it's important. I, I just feel so grateful to be able to learn, I guess, in that way. I don't know if that correctly touches on your question. Okay. Um, I had created a piece um, in 2014. It was like my first year here at MCAT. And I was tasked to create this piece that was in response to that baseball team in Washington. And so um, one of the things that I thought about was like, how do, how, how do you create something that's in response to something negative? 
or something that, you know, depicts another, like my people negatively. And, um, but I didn't want to be hostile in my response or how I created my piece. And so um, through research here at the MCAD library, actually, um, I had found this book that talked about, you know, hand gestures that Native Americans would typically make. And um, one of the hand gestures that I had um, noticed in the book was like how we express shame. And it was just, you know how you, like when a child is laughing or, um, or a child is like, you like feel like they, you make them feel bad. They cover their face like in shame, like they just cover it. Um, and I was like, oh man, that's powerful. And so I took that, I, that, that concept and then I took a picture of my niece doing that very thing. And then I you know, tra translated it artistically. And it was impactful to my community, so much so that they wanted, you know, they wanted to see more of that around or they wanted to be able to like interact with that piece or share it across their social media. It was just meaningful because it resonated with them like, yeah, that is exactly how it makes me feel like, but in a way that is not hostile, you know? So I don't know if that, huh? That that yes, you. yes, that is, and that's why I was like, oh, I should bring that up because um, that is how we met. And I remember we had like a conversation about it and um, it's since been, you know, plastered on trains and stuff and it's been in a travel and art exhi exhibit throughout the country so it was pretty cool so does anybody want to add anything else i think it's so interesting just to hear um the word research come up a lot with your work um it's very important to also you know um understand and see different um viewpoints on things, but also on the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you for sharing those points. Um, I also want to be respectful of our time. I know that we're cutting close. So I also wanted to open it up to Q&A for um, members in the audience. I know that Julie had a quick Q&A earlier, but this is also um, for you to ask a question to our amazing panel here of anything that you might be thinking about or anything like that. So please. Um, Ask away. Don't all raise your hands at once. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Um, hi. So I, uh, I'm a freelance designer, and I have kind of been making an effort to really aim my practice in um, kind of the nonprofit sector and in causes that I believe in. Um, but what I'm kind of continually coming up against is that often the causes that I believe So I'm just really curious kind of about how, I mean, you all have such very different backgrounds and the way that you kind of move through the world and the work that you're doing. I'm just curious how that factors into your decision making um, and the projects that you take on. And if you've kind of found like strange new ways to like get, get paid for these really wonderful things that you're doing. Um, well, I actually worked. Um, right out of when I graduated from MCAD in a nonprofit for a social enterprise that it was a social enterprise for a nonprofit. Um, but also a lot of my freelance work is in the nonprofit sector as well. And I feel like if I keep my prices low over time, they, they keep coming back for more work. So um, over time, you're going to earn that income you know, that you're going to need for if you keep your cost points low and you make it attainable for them. Because, I mean, nonprofits, they don't necessarily have the money, nor do they actually value design, too, sometimes. I've come across that. Um, so, you know, it's just about making it accessible, but also, you know, the, for making that client a longevity client. 
that's what I would do. So they like make room for it in the future. Like, oh, <coughs> we need to remember to leave room in the budget for design. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like a slow game for sure. And yeah. it's very important. Design is very important. So it's so important. very so important. important. <laughs> and you can do things as gifts too. Like Julie talked about donating her time and so did Lucy. Just like I saw this place needed a logo, so I designed a logo for them. And maybe you don't get paid the first time or the second time, but if you're kind of that tenacious person who wants to help out and really is concerned about the organization, they might find a place for you. And those things happen in surprising ways. If you have an internship or volunteer or just, you know, post something on Instagram. Not to mention that the work that you're doing for them too is going to reflect positively on you when you do go out, put yourself out there for employment. They're going to look at that community engagement like that's pretty awesome that you do that. So. I um, completely agree with both of you and um, I've done like the same thing of like adjusting prices to fit the cause and also knowing that um, I get represented with my values which in some ways like I cannot put a price on that. Um, I kind of like when I do this sort of work like I try to make it so then I get some of those things and make sure that it's clear. I also try to trade off like this like kind of cultural social clout. Like sometimes I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll make an image, but you need to post it like four times in this time frame and you need to tag me, like that kind of thing. So there's sort of like this return on investment thing. And the other thing that's really beneficial and amazing about nonprofits, um, the ones that do have like these really in-depth communication teams, um, that work kind of does the work for you out in the world. Like I think about with Pollen where I've done work for them. Thanks, Pollen. Yay, Pollen. <laughs> Thanks, Pollen. <laughs> but I mean, like, it's a good example. Because Thank you. Thank oh. you, by the way. It's oh. the other way. Thanks, everybody. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, it, it does do that work where, you know, if you work with a group that really, like, kind of, I think, honors the work um, and, like, honors, like, your cause. It, like, ends up being, like, this bigger thing that, like, other people see. And not only that, it's this bigger reference thing. I feel I've done a ton of volunteer work um, that has led to other work, especially because, like, a lot of nonprofits and cause stuff don't know graphic design people. Like, for example, um, recently I did, like, a poster that took me like maybe one hour for, um, oh my God, I'm, so, I'm blanking our name out, Nervousness. Um, for? She like basically was told to apologize for. Melissa Hortman. Yeah, God, I feel so yeah. embarrassed. I made her a thing. Like, <laughs> so many women are asked or are in that situation. Yeah, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, Melissa. But yeah, I mean, I did that like for free, you know, and just because I was like, man, I do, I like stand behind her and want to, and like I didn't know what would happen with these signs, and then I like a friend sent me a link to like Care Eleven showing it. And I, and you know, at the same time too, with like that work beginning more work, it's like okay, I now I'm aligned with this cause. People saw this in a way that I didn't, you know, imagine that they would see it. And then I also asked like the person to like just give me a credit. Um, so I, I don't know if that that answers some questions. But also to add, um, I think it also breaks a mold in a way because with design, you know, coming with that perspective of you know, it's going to be too expensive or it also um, starts shying away from that perspective of the design is too expensive and then just more of like, hey, this person did this for us and the word of mouth starts, you know, spreading the word of how mm -hmm. there are people out there that are interested in working with organizations. It's just a matter of like starting with an ask and going from there. So. Yeah, just to add to that too, um, don't be afraid to ask them at the same time, like, okay, I can do this for X amount of dollars, but this is at this is at a very low rate. So it would be, you know, I would appreciate if you shared my if I you reference or provide a reference for me and send me more work. That way you're putting yourself out there too and not afraid to ask for it. And it's cool to that point, like that leads to work that's in your interest. Like yeah. I've done so much nonprofit work or free work that like was not paid. And then again, like since that audience base is like kind of in the same cause like mind, mm -hmm. it's led to like paid work with that is just like, oh, how did you see this? And they're like, yeah. oh, remember that thing you did like yeah. four years ago? I, I don't know if that's happened for you too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can comment real quickly as um, as a non-designer. <laughs> like I don't, I'm not asked too often to do um, f 
uh, free work, but I do, uh, I have, it's not very easy to sell paintings. Like, let's just be real. Like, I mean, <laughs> like they're accessible, but it's not like I'm like selling paintings like hotcakes. <laughs> and so, um, and so what often I do, especially with work that is um, related to like, yeah, social justice, like I apply for a grant. That way I don't have to worry about selling the work. You know, like you're applying for a grant for the project, so the project is fully funded ahead of time. Um, or if you are doing, I mean, I have donated work to causes, um, and then in a way, then it, you know, then you can just write it off on your taxes, which is helpful. I mean, like that's like one little like side, that, you know, that, that kind of helps. Um, but uh, that's kind of, yeah, from like a fine artist standpoint, that's, that's how I've been working it. <laughs> And I don't want to like make this seem like a sunshiny situation where like just just do it and you'll you'll be able to pay your bills eventually. Like it's hard, like it's super hard. But um, sometimes you know you'll be doing this other job that might pay well for a client that you're like lukewarm about, and you're like you're funding my passion project over here that's paying me ten dollars. Like I just kind of think about that. Like I'm putting up with this to pay my bills Balance. so that I can I can do this over here that's more of a long-term investment. So it's it's nice to hear like other people going through that same thing because sometimes you're like, I'm doing this wrong. Like well, I'm doing things for really cheap. But like I think you kind of have to get strategic sometimes. I want to also say too, like I think this was really great. Like Bobby Rogers did this cheat sheet event and something he mentioned during this, which was like, like I'm still learning. Like he, he like I was supposed to be an expert <laughs> illustrator. I was like, oh wait, I'm learning at this event too, which is amazing. But he said something too of like that work that's like a ten dollar work, you know, can be in your portfolio, and nobody knows that. It, it's also like this experience thing too, and this fantastic piece that maybe you wouldn't have made. Um, yeah, I don't know if that like resonates as well for others. Just do what you want to do. Like, be strategic about the projects that you take on. You know, like if the project sounds really interesting, but you don't feel like you're getting paid, you know, like enough money for it, or getting paid at all, like ask yourself, is this something that you want to do? Is it worth it for you? And if it is, if that's a yes, then do it. Then don't feel guilty about that. And to your point, do you think that affects the quality of your work? You know, one thing that's a passion project versus something for a client? I think no, I guess. Maybe broad answer. God, I, I'm saying that. I'm like, maybe I, I didn't get the question right. No, <laughs> it's, there's not a right or wrong. Um, well, okay, like, I don't know if I'm touching on this or not. Like, are you talking about quality discrepancy or, like, payment resentment, kind of, or? <laughs> Everything. <It's> definite scale. <laughs> like, uh, the quality, I would say. I, that. I would love to kind of bring this to everyone in the same way, because I think that's a hmm. good question in the sense of, like, like when you do work, I think that is this cause related, it kind of unfolds in a different way than client work. Like I think with client work, it's like, oh, an illustration, I don't know what it's gonna be, but I know it's gonna be an image and it's gonna live here. And I think about like each of the projects that um, we've all touched on and how they've unfolded in a way that's been like kind of real time, I guess. I, I don't know if anybody else resonates with that. Yeah, I feel like Molly, your project is becoming like one of those things that like obviously the dollars aren't rolling in you know but it's it's really based just on kind of the sharing economy model mm -hmm. so i don't need a thousand dollars to make this happen i just need some people who are interested in sharing things that they know to come hang out in the same room and i feel like julie with yours it's your babes project you were able to make that your activism so you didn't have to take the time or afterwards after the election make the effort to make the calls to the congressman, which I know you did for a long time, but then you realize like, wait a minute, I'm, I have this special power that I can use in a different kind of way to serve this. So I think disconnecting money from that equation, if you wanna have impact, I think that's the way to do it. Sometimes you get paid to do that, but if, if you're leaning on that, I think that you're not going to think as big as you could if you're just on your own trying to fig be creative about how you can get into a system and get people to see your work and change something. That's great. Anybody else want? I think as artists, I don't think any artist would sacrifice quality based on compensation because at the end of the day, that is your work and you're putting 
your name on the line for something that's going to be put out there in the public. So I don't, so like for me, it's regardless of compensation, I'm going to put 110 into whatever I'm working on. That's great. Um, anybody else in the audience that would like to ask a question? Back there. Uh, <laughs> Great question. Who wants to take a stab at that? Well, I feel like I'm just mobilizing some very close St. Olaf friends and then the friends that we've brought in since college. So I think that Julie and I and some of you here lived in this house together for two years called the Art House. And we figured out this really supportive, amazing, magical community somehow that we don't really have now, you know, we're all doing our own things, but it's like, how can we get that collective strength back where it's this very supportive group of people who are interested in helping each other, like everyone helping Julie come up with that list of babes. Um, yeah, I'm kind of losing sight of the project, but yeah, I think that was, without that background, I don't think I would be doing this project. Um, yeah. I think St. Elf was a big part of that. Um, I guess for me, for like being at MCAD, I think it's given me the courage to be unapologetic about the advocacy work that I want to create um, and being true to myself and my heritage and honoring, you know, my people. That's great. And I was just going to ask Allegra or. Leslie, if you wanted to add anything to that with your work? Uh, yeah, I would say that <laughs> uh, graduate school, I definitely, I think there were, it was like a two-part combination where like my mentor, her name was Amy DeGenero, she was so kick-ass. She was awesome and she really helped me um, become confident in my in my voice because um, I was confident in my work but not in uh, my voice so what I mean like I was confident in my skill set but not the narrative behind my work um, and so she really helped me find that because you know talking about personal stuff and identity is very difficult when you're like looking inward and like exposing yourself to the world um, and so that was very very helpful and props to MCAD for hooking me up with her and then um, just the cohort in the grad school the pr program was really awesome I found my people there were like three or four uh, people specifically who like I really vibed with and we were all making work that was like very similar specifically talking about um, racial identity and like I had never had that before you know I went when I was in school at the Univers University of Wisconsin Stout, I was the only black female in the entire art program of four years. So that was very difficult. <laughs> so I didn't have really anybody to talk to about my work. Um, and so what MCAT provided me in the graduate program was that space. And that was really, um, yeah, that was really um, important. What were your outlets in going back to those four years for you to, you know, like to talk to someone like what did you do and did you find it more internally with yourself or did you like find other resources that would help out with your work yeah, I just talked to myself I walked around talking to myself <laughs> um, no actually I just kind of hit it to be honest with you it was a uh, you know uh, you know like when you have like a fight-or-flight response like it was mostly flight um, yeah so like just to be honest like that's kind of what you did like you just kind of assimilated um, but I mean, I was also in a new space. I was in Wisconsin, a very small town in Wisconsin. It was the first time I'd ever been in a small town living situation. So um, you do what you do to survive, you know, um, and thrive, and then, and then you get out. <laughs> now I'm okay. you Come back to the city. <laughs> Apologies for that image of you just walking down the halls, just talking, <laughs> just like to, talking yourself. to myself. Yeah. Like, uh, raise. Uh. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else who would like to ask a question to the amazing panel, Julie? <laughs> Hi. Hi, I know your name. <laughs> uh, this question is for Leslie, but um, by all means, other people want to chime in. Um, I'm curious about this idea of translating people's reality, and especially in your, your loving show at Public Functionary, when you're trying to convey someone else's story. Mm -hmm. At what point do you 
if at all, engage your subject in the work to say, this is what I'm thinking of, this is what I'm coming up with. Yeah. Do you solicit feedback, or is it like a firewall between you and that's a really good question. It definitely happens organically. Like I think with with all the people, uh, the families that I was working with, um, they knew what the project was about before I met them. So they already, when you're talking about uh, racial identity and interracial relationships, you know, they already knew that was the topic. They already knew that Loving versus Virginia was was you know kind of the the nugget that like, started the whole thing. Um, so they already had thoughts about that. So when I met them. Um, I would say about half of them I met through the project. Others I already knew beforehand. But um, the people that I didn't know before the project and I met in person, like as I was taking their photos, um, you know, which would be like an hour to two hour long photo shoot slash discussion, like they already had thoughts. Um, and so it wasn't really too difficult. Um, and I didn't have a lot of prompting. But yeah, I mean, I would ask like the typical questions, you know, to like the the couple, you know, like, oh, how did you meet? Um, and what was it like growing up? You know, how, you know, like those like typical questions, but they usually had a lot to share um, because they reached out to be in the project in the first place. So that was really um, helpful. And then, yeah, as far as like taking what they told me and then having, and then having the impact the work, like there was this moment where, you know, I already had like, one way I wanted to depict the the individuals in the project, like I really wanted these paintings to feel to feel very um, this is like a quote like <laughs> to feel mundane in the best kind of way, right? Like very normal, um, because that's what I was trying to get at is like a sense of normalcy because these are images that you don't see typically um, in mainstream media, and so. Um, but at the same time, I had this like kind of mission, right? But then I also wanted to be respectful to their what they were bringing to the, the table and their own narratives and you know and story and I wanted to make sure that yeah I was being respectful to that so it was like an interesting dance um, when I was making this work and it was definitely complex but um, in the end it was uh, yeah I wouldn't take anything I wouldn't do anything differently like that difficulty was very rewarding um, and it was a really nice marriage between like what I wanted to see in the work and then what happened organically from. Um, the experiences that I have with these people. Thank you for sharing that. It was a great exhibit. <laughs> Back there, I have a question. This is for Julie. Did any of the meta saves actually reach out to you, or did you reach out to any of them? And let them know that you were working on the project? Because I think that's really important. Yeah. Or did you just kind of like reach out to them? I never reached out beforehand. Um, I, if I would try to find out if they are were still alive, if they had an Instagram account, so I could tag them, um, which also was felt kind of slimy. But like again, just getting to know the social media thing, um, I was like, hey, and so that's how like Roxanne Gay knew about the thing because I mean, obviously she wasn't following me beforehand, but um, and you know, Ilhan Omar was a like probably the the best connection I made, but um, yeah, I think. You know, the, there was an occasional like acknowledgement of it, and beyond um, beyond tagging them and you know just being like, hey, hashtag your name. Um, I, I tried to kind of just let it be, just to to respect their space. But um, but yeah, I think I think that what's really cool is that you know with this event. Um, I reached out to Jana Shortall, who I met at an event. I'm like, hey, I'm the weirdo who gave you fan art. Like, do you want to come to this event? And she's like, I have class. And so um, <laughs> I was like, dang it, uh, <laughs> Jana. But uh, I, you know, like people like Melissa Hortman and like people who would have easily fit into this 100, you know, uh, group of 100 and beyond, like the, uh, like I want to work with these people. Like I revere them so much that like, I feel like there's a little bit of like a an opening there like hey I drew you once like do you want to work together you know like I think that um hey chow girls <laughs> like I think uh, uh like I think it's just like this is my this is what I can offer like this is my interface with you know things I am excited about so um I'm hoping that more doors will open that way but it, I try to keep it a little bit professional you know um trying to think about yeah, I think the closest I came was actually May Lee, who is um, 
a she's a Hmong American farmer who works with a dear friend of mine, and so she was a very very local profile that I was just like you know what like this is a badass in like a, a realm that I like I don't know a lot about but my friend Molly does and so uh, and she, you know apparently you know everyone on the farm was really excited about it and like um, apparently and uh, hearing about like her seeing the picture was really exciting um, I think the same thing happened with sister Simone Campbell who like the nuns on the bus woman apparently like you know six months after the project wrapped um someone that works with her sent me an email like sister simone loved your picture or just like that's that's what they did i was like that's so awesome so yeah it was just it's pretty casual but i feel like you know especially the local folks like nakima i really want to run a hang out with her a little bit um <laughs> what was the reaction from malala they did oh see that they... oh my god malala uh her her organization reached out to me. I don't know. If she I think she might have seen it, but uh, they were the first people to respond. She was like in week one, but I love her and I love her family and I love her organization and um, they were super excited about it and they asked if they could share it on their social media and I said oh, yes, of course. <laughs> um, and I think they had it as like their profile picture for like a couple weeks or something, but. Yeah, Malala is someone, again, like when the election happened, I was like, Malala got shot in the face. We can get through this. Because like she is just this like incredible example of adversity and like love and humility amidst like absolute horror. And her and her, like her whole organization has to do with education. Like most of the crap that we have to deal with that needs improving can be solved with education. Like that's it. And like education comes in lots of different forms. And I really truly believe that the most powerful educative, educa educational tool, uh, words are hard, uh, is storytelling. Like we think in narrative. And so, like that w is what makes me feel empowered. I'm like, all right, like storytelling is in my wheelhouse. I second that. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. So yeah, it just feels like, you know, when I hear like my distant relatives be like, oh, and your artsy fartsy projects, like I think like, no, I have some, I have some power. I, I have, I have some things that I can bring to the table. So you do, thanks, and everybody Monica. does. You yeah, for it. sure. Yes. Everyone up here. Um, anybody else before we wrap up because we want to be respectful of your time and make sure that we don't go over anybody else would like to ask a question to the panel 